Wow, isn't that a picture? What kind of bee is that, Susan? Um, that's a common eastern bumblebee. It's a worker bee. The 5 o'clock show tonight is looking into the world of bees thanks to pollination biologist Susan Chan. That is the bumblebee, and I think we had some honeybees here as well. Yep, I don't see any at the moment. We're going to find out about the differences between different bees, the different purposes that they all serve, and you know what? Even the wasps, sorry to say, not such the bad guys you thought they were. We're going to find out why. Here on the property of Susan Chan, where the world of bees is happening all around us. This is Susan Chan, the yeah. pollination <laughs> biologist and beekeeper. Yes. Now behind us are the honeybee hives that I expect to see, but what have you um, made to hear? What we have here is a top bar hive, and this is an, a very simple, traditional hive that, you, that was first invented in Africa. And lots of people are becoming interested in having it in Canada because it's so simple and uh, because the bees in this hive make all their own comb. So in that hive, they start off with foundation, and ah. then they build foundation out from the comb. But in this hive, they start with nothing, and then they build their comb. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I'm does it take I... longer than to get to where you're harvesting yes, honey? Yes, it does. Because of that? It does take longer, um, but there are many reasons why people like this, and one of the reasons is they feel that the, the wax is purer. It doesn't get contaminated by... Um, because uh, it's not manufactured. That's right, because it's not manufactured. Okay. So it all comes from the hive that it's made in, instead of coming from elsewhere than brought in. So these bees are the same as the bees behind us. Exactly the same. They're honey bees. Yes, so honey bees are kind of like domesticated animals. They're like cows, chickens, horses. They were brought with colonists, and they weren't brought over for pollination. They were brought over um, to produce honey and to make beeswax because they needed a sweetener and they needed something to make candles with. Oh, cool, but they, yeah. they are also pollinators. Oh, absolutely, yes, they're pollinators because they're bees, but they're not native to here. They don't come from Canada uh, or so even North America. How are they able to survive and overwinter here? Well, because we have a climate that's fairly simple to, similar to Europe, and that's where they came from. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. so they, they, can't do, they don't do all that well all by themselves, so they need some help from beekeepers, and that's why we have beekeepers, because beehives need... It's just like a domesticated animal. They need farmers, D domesticated animals need farmers to survive, sure. and beekeepers uh, help bees, these kinds of bees, honey bees, to survive. What are the biggest things that you do as a beekeeper, or that a beekeeper does? Well, we watch for things like queenlessness. So if a hive, for some reason, becomes queenless, the queen um, dies, or the queen dies um, then a beekeeper can insert him or herself and help to create a new queen by managing the hive properly. And it's a, it's a, we can, we can either buy a queen in and put it in a colony, or we can help the bees to raise another queen. Wow! Yeah. That sounds like a, like a TV show. Yeah. And remember, this is not the kind of hive that a commercial beekeeper has. It's too much work for commercial beekeeping. I don't know if you can see, but can you see the bees that are flying in here? This is They're their entrance, and, yes. and you see they have a little orange things on their back legs. Oh, they do! Uh, I don't know if you can, there's, as they come in, that's goldenrod pollen. Wow! It's coming in from the goldenrod. <gasps> oh my gosh. So we don't need to open up the whole hive. No. You can see a lot of things just by looking. So there's the comb that they're building. Now, are they going to sting? Us? Well, if you get too close, they may sting you. All right, I'll stay back here. <laughs> so you can see comb. Yeah, one just stung me there. Okay. Because we haven't used smoke on them. But they're really very gentle. So here's comb that they've built. I'm going to close her up because we didn't have our smoker ready. Mm -hmm. Shall we okay, get just one? Just move back. Just move back. Okay. Go on. I've got one in my hair. Just move back. Move back. Okay. So the bees were not happy with us. Um, we didn't have a smoker, so we've decided to let the bees lie. Yeah. The uh, honey bees. The honey bees, yes. which will sting you. Native bees do not sting. Yes. And we're going to track those down in a minute. And, and anything, is it fair that anything that affects the native bees is also affecting the honey bees? Oh, absolutely, and vice versa. So things that are affecting honey bees are affecting native bees also. Um, so things like insecticides. Um, insecticides are very, very lethal to bees because they um, don't have the ability to detoxify. So a lot of pest insects, oh. like beetles, for example, can take um, insecticides, which are toxins, and they can detoxify them. And so you have to give them a bigger dose for them to be able to be killed. But honeybees or other bees don't have that ability. So that's why they're much more susceptible to insecticides, for example, than right. um, 
than the many of the crops that we need to use pesticides on. Uh, this is a tiny creature, but a critical creature to our existence. Absolutely, yes. More continues with Susan Chan, pollination biologist on the 5 o'clock show. The 5 o'clock show is playing the pollination game for the survival of humanity. Oh my. You like that? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but when you get right down to it, that's what it is. Yep. It's not just the survival of humanity, it's also the survival of wildlife, birds, mammals. Um, they're all dependent on, on pollinators. Maybe we better walk a little we'll further walk a little away. Bit. So we're moving on from honeybees, yes. uh, which were brought here to make honey and to make beeswax, mm -hmm. to native bees. Yes. There, there are several species of native bees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, several is a, is a small Holy world. Holy smokes! 400 species of native bees in Ontario. There are many more than that in the world. Uh, 20,000 in the world. Why so many different kinds of bees? So we have so many different species because it's like if you think about uh, different kinds of fishes, you know, why do we have so many different kinds of fish? Because they live in different places, they eat different things, oh. um, they, they specialize in certain environments and so same thing with bees, with native bees. How do I know if it's a wasp or a hornet and do those provide us with any of those pollination factors? Right. Are they any good to us? <laughs> Well, absolutely they are good to us. They are good to us because they're predators. So oh. most of the pest insects that we have are actually herbivores. They're things that eat plants, and so that's why they're pests to us, because they eat the plants that we're trying to grow. Now, wasps are predators. They eat the insects that eat the plants that we're trying oh. to grow. They don't eat the adults, they eat the larvae. And so they'll go and they'll gather larvae, They'll take them back to their nests, and as we, uh, maybe later on we can go and see one of those nests. They take them back to their <laughs> nests. Distance. Well, they don't sting. No, well, I've said that already. <laughs> anyway, they take them back to their nests, and they lay an egg on the larva, and then the egg hatches and oh. eats the larva. So that's their protein source. So they're a natural pest control. That's right, a natural pest control. They're all needed. Right? But on the other hand, if you've got a wasp stinging you, then you're going to hit it, right? Because it's hurting you. That's And, and maybe you don't want a wasp nest underneath your porch. That's right. So it's all a matter of what you can tolerate, where you can tolerate it. Um, okay. You know, I'm not just saying that people should embrace wasps. <laughs> but I'm, I am okay. saying that we need to remember that they have a function in the environment, in the, in the ecosystem. Hold on, Kevin, I'm going to get this bee from you. <laughs> bee right here. Oh, bee right in your lip. There we go. She's gone. And what I'm trying to do on my property is create a haven for insects, specifically for pollinators, but that means all insects like to live here. So first of all, there's no insecticide sprayed on this property, and there's no herbicide sprayed on this property. So I don't use anything to eliminate weeds. But you also notice that I allow goldenrod to grow. People think that goldenrod causes allergies, but it actually does not cause allergies. It's an, it's an insect pollinated plant, it's not a wind pollinated plant. The allergy causing thing is ragweed, not, um, not, not goldenrod. goldenrod. You'll notice back there there's purple aster, that's Beautiful. another one. Okay. And there's also some milkweed back there. So these are all things that I allow to stay on my property. I don't actively take them out um, except if I'm trying to grow something specific and I have to remove them, then I do. But I, I try to tolerate them as much as possible. Well, I call it the property of Susan Chan, but it really is the laboratory of Susan <laughs> Chan. Yeah. Now, you can have uh, a chance to listen to Susan Chan speak about pollinators and biology and uh, bees in our world. Right. Tuesday night, yes, September 7.30 p.m., September 10th, as a guest of the Lakefield Horticultural Society. And you'll be speaking at the Marshland Center. Find out more about it at www.lakefieldcourt.org. I'll tell you, if we can get this much information in just a few minutes from our show, imagine a whole hour with Susan Chan. Find out more through lakefieldcourt.org. And we continue here in Susan's lab on the 5 o'clock show. Those are the nests there. That These ones haven't been occupied. Oh, there's some holes there. Yeah. Then some of them are full. Yeah, so these ones have actually been parasitized, so something has come in and eaten the larva of the bee. See, it's all a cycle. Everything has its own predators and its own problems. Um, that's how everything is kept in check and balance. So you have these on your property. These yeah. are for native bees, bees one yeah. of the 400 of species yeah. that Ontario yeah. has. Yeah. You're not looking for honey out of these guys. Yeah. They're pollinators. No. Do you have to do anything to manage this no. for them? No, absolutely not. So what I do is I put this up for them. And 
this gives them a place. So they're cavity nesters. They dwell normally in sticks, in hollow sticks. And so I've just provided some hollow stick substitutes here. Okay. So, they, so one bee will occupy one hole. And she, they're solitary, so they don't live in colonies. So one bee makes one nest, and the one nest is one hole. Are they stingers? No, they don't sting. Oh, and so people so are going, okay, I can help you with can those ones. So totally do this, yeah. There and there's go. a guy in Peterborough that makes these nests, as a matter of fact. It's called Animal House, and he, he made these nests, and uh, I've had great pleasure at putting them up. Tell me about your tomato sauce. Okay, it's special because it comes from it, it comes from tomato, and tomato is a plant that needs a pollinator to set fruit. Mm. And it needs a special kind of a pollinator. It needs um, bumblebees. Bumblebees are really good at pollinating tomato plants because they can vibrate the flower, and you, the flower doesn't release its pollen unless it is vibrated like that. So honeybees are not very good at it. And you know your greenhouse tomatoes that you eat? Yes. From, yeah, so those come from greenhouses down south in Ontario, and um, they use honey bee, uh, bumblebees to do that pollination. And have them there. Oh, see, yeah. there's some things that you yeah, just so need nature for. Yes, you do, absolutely. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a really remarkable book, A Landowner's Guide to Conserving Native Pollinators. Uh, you did this, you put I this did, together. Yeah. It's uh. a real how-to guide for anybody who wants to be part of the, part of saving humanity. <laughs> uh, yeah. But there are some bees that are missing. Um, let's talk about the rusty patch, shall we? Okay, um, now the rusty patch bumblebee is right there. It's also on the cover of the book. The rusty patch bumblebee is a bee that used to be common in Ontario 30 years ago. It was a bee that nobody paid any attention to because it was common, you know, like the common eastern bumblebee is today. And um, since then, the populations have declined so much that the last time we've seen a rusty patch bumblebee in Ontario is in 2009. <gasps> yeah. So it's... Holy! Um, yeah, we don't know exactly why it has disappeared, um, but we feel like it's um, it's like a poster child for pollinators. It's a, it's a bee that's telling us that something is wrong. Precious information from Susan Chan. Thank you very much for sharing these details with us. <laughs> My pleasure. Find out more uh, through the Ministry of Natural Resources and also Farms at Work. Farms at Work is website. Is there a website? Yes, yes. Uh, www.farmsatwork.ca.